message this week, and uh, I was able to find a five-minute clip on YouTube. So I really pray this clip blesses your life. It's an amazing, incredible story of a man who is completely dedicated to the work of Christ. So let's have the lights off, and let's roll it. It was April 15, 1912, the year of our Lord, when the HMS Titanic sank beneath the icy waters of the North Atlantic, taking with it 1,517 lives. The largest and most luxurious ship known to man at the time was gone, reminding the world of our frailty as human beings. But there is more to the sinking of the Titanic than a historical tragedy. There is a story of courageous heroism and unshakable faith. John Harper was aboard the Titanic when she set sail from Southampton, England on her maiden voyage. An evangelist, originally from Glasgow, Scotland, he was well known throughout the United Kingdom as a charismatic, passionate speaker who led many to Christ through his gift of preaching. In 1912, Reverend Harper received an invitation to speak at the Moody Church in Chicago, USA. And on April 11, 1912, John Harper boarded the Titanic. The world was captivated with the ship. Widely proclaimed as unsinkable, it was the largest movable object ever built by man at the time. Some of the wealthiest people in the world were aboard. While many of the passengers spoke of business deals, acquisitions, and material desires, John Harper was diligently sharing the love of Christ with others. In the days leading up to the tragedy, survivors reported seeing Harper living like a man of faith, speaking kind words, and sharing the love of Christ. On the evening of April 14th, as passengers danced in the ballroom and tried their luck at the card tables, John Harper put his daughter to bed and read his devotions, as he did every night. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic struck an iceberg. The unsinkable ship was doomed. Either in disbelief or unaware at the time, passengers continued about their pleasures. It wasn't until the ship's crew sent up a series of distress flares, lighting up the moonless night, that passengers finally realized the seriousness of their situation. Then chaos ensued. It all happened so fast that John Harper could only react. His response left an historic example of courage and faith. Harper awakened his daughter, picked her up, and wrapped her in a blanket before carrying her up to the deck. There he kissed her goodbye and handed her to a crewman who put her into boat number 11. Harper knew he would never see his daughter again, and his daughter would be left an orphan at six years of age. Harper then gave his life jacket to a fellow passenger, ending any chance of his survival. While the light of other worldly ambitions began to flicker and die, John Harper's burned even brighter. As the sounds of terror and mayhem continued, Harper focused on his God-given purpose. Survivors reported seeing him on the upper deck, surrounded by terrified passengers, on his knees, praying for their salvation. At 2.40 a.m., the Titanic disappeared beneath the North Atlantic, leaving a mushroom-like cloud of smoke and steam above her grave, and tragically, over 1,000 people, including Harper, fighting for their lives in the icy water. He managed to find a piece of floating wreckage to hold on to. Quickly, he swam up to every person he could find, urging those about him to put their faith in Jesus Christ. While death forced others to face the folly of their life's pursuits, John Harper's goal of winning men to Jesus Christ became more vital. Soon, John Harper began to succumb to the sea. Even in his last moment, this tireless man of undying faith continued his life pursuit of winning lost souls. I am a survivor of the Titanic. I was one of only six people out of 1,517 to be pulled from the icy waters on that dreadful night. Like the hundreds around me, I found myself struggling in the cold, dark waters of the North Atlantic. The wail of the perishing was ringing in my ears when there floated by me a man who called to me, Is your soul saved? 
I heard him call out to others as he and everyone around me sank beneath the waters to eternity. There alone in the night, with two miles of water under me, I cried to Christ to save me. I am John Harper's last convert. Harper, as he knew then, would not survive. But his example of undying faith and commitment to the Word of God lives as an example for all to see. In the midst of that desperate assemblage of drowning men, women, and children, he pointed them to the cross, and thus, as he lived, died with that one name upon his lips, Jesus Christ. Wow. Right, can we take up the tithes and offering, please? And kids, it's time for you to go out. Um, and uh, those who are plus five, five and over, if you can uh, head out with faith. And parents, if you can sign the children out and back in when they come back in. And for the little ones, there is uh, some packs as well up the back that Sue has for you. The Lord bless you as you give. It's been so quiet this morning. Fantastic. What a story. How many of you knew about John Harper? Okay. One person. It was a new story to me this week. And uh, today I'm in the last episode of this series that I've been doing in the last two months called Burnt Stones. And uh, as I was reflecting on our last text this morning for the series... John Harper's story burned deeply within my heart. A man who was a true warrior who fought to his very last breath to bring eternal life to other people. A man who never gave up, a man who never focused on himself, but a man who was prepared to give his own life away. In fact, what it doesn't say on the video is that he pleaded with the Christians he knew were on board to give up their places in the lifeboat for those who didn't know Christ. And, uh, and he also proclaimed the gospel on the boat as people were jumping into the lifeboats. And then, of course, as he was swimming in the water to his very last breath, John Harper displayed what it meant to be a true warrior of Jesus Christ. A man who wasn't focused on himself, but was completely focused on those and their need to receive Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want to take my text from Nehemiah chapter 4. Verse 14, it says, do not be afraid. Remember the Lord. Do not be afraid. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight. And this was right at a moment in the history of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem that had been destroyed by her enemies The temple had been destroyed. The city was broken. And this is where we get the name of the series from, where the enemy came in and began to mock the Jews who returned under Nehemiah to rebuild the broken wall. And there were stones that were burnt in rubble. And they mocked and said, can you really revive these burnt stones? And you know, the great news about Jesus Christ is even in this room, there are lives that have been burnt by the devil. There's been lives that have been charred and left empty, ready to be trodden underfoot by men and women, but lives who have somehow miraculously been resurrected, brought back to life, and the life of the Spirit has breathed a brand new hope and a future into a life where everybody else said, they're nothing, they're just going to be discarded, left as rubble, burnt stones. Can these burnt stones be revived? Absolutely they can. Nobody is beyond the redemption of a God of love who gave the most special person to him, his very own son, so that our lives could be restored and brought back.
back to life. So he said, do not be afraid. Why did he say that? Because the enemy started pressing in hard. Do you know what happens when you start getting focused for Jesus Christ? Suddenly you've got enemies you never even knew you had. Suddenly you're finding yourself hard pressed. Suddenly you're finding temptations thrown in front of you, left, right and centre as you begin to press in. And as they made a start on rebuilding the wall, as they begin to get these burnt stones and start restoring them and placing them back in the wall of destiny. As they began to do that, the enemy suddenly got serious and realized that these guys were serious about their intentions, that they were going to rebuild this wall. They started mocking them initially and they started saying, even if a fox ran over the top of your wall, it would fall over. But suddenly as they started making progress, just like you, when you start to make progress, the enemy will try and come in like a flood around your life. But the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against the devil to protect you from the works of darkness around about your life. What God wants from you this morning is your focus. What he wants from you is your attention. What he wants from you is first things first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that the world seeks, all the stuff, all the things that Blair was talking about this morning, all those things, God said, I'll add them to you as you need them in your life. You don't have to pursue those things. If you're prepared to put me first, you can know that I'm going to look after you and I'm going to take care of you. Amen. As we begin to focus and as they began to focus And the wall started going up. The enemy started coming in hard. And then he started making threats. And he started saying to the people, you're going to you're going to wake up one day and the enemy is going to be coming at you from 10 different directions. And they began to spread fear amongst the people of God and Nehemiah, whose name means comfort from God. Just as the Holy Spirit is the comforter who has been given to us. When you receive Christ, you receive the comforter. When you receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the comforter comes and he lives in you. And he abides wherever you go, he goes with you. You're never without the Spirit of God. He's there continuously with you. And he brings comfort to you in times of trial, in times of stress from within. You see, if we're left to rely on just getting help from outside all the time, we're as doomed as anybody else in the world. But God created this wonderful system. And he said, he said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm not going to leave you to try and get through this life on your own. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to be with you and he's going to be in you. And so wherever you go, you take him with you. And so Nehemiah is sent by God, the comforter, and he begins to bring a leadership strategy to the people of God. And suddenly people start following him. And then as they start following him, he starts to develop a strategy to confound the works of the enemy. And he says to us this morning, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Because he knew the enemy was pressing in with a whole new wave of fear. Fear of the future. Fear of failure. Fear of not ever making it. Fear of not fulfilling their destiny. Fear of being a swear word amongst the nations. A curse word. Oh, where's your God? Look at your city. It's broken down. Look at your temple. Why isn't your God defending you? How come your temple's all broken down? As the fear began to come in, Nehemiah rises up and he says to us this morning, do not be afraid. He says, why? Because you can remember the Lord great and awesome today. Great and awesome. And then he says to them, and now I want you to get up and fight. I don't want you to lie down. I want you to stand up. I want you to believe in who I've made you to be. I want you to understand who you are in Christ Jesus today. A son and a daughter of the Most High God who's been given a spiritual inheritance, who has been raised up with Christ and together with Him this morning we rule seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ today. Praise the name of the Lord. You see, friends, what Nehemiah was doing is that every generation, every generation on the planet has a roll call from God. Anson, present. Richardson, present this morning, Lord. Kuvas, present this morning, Lord, ready to serve you. 
He's calling out names. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. Did you hear that? To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal. Another translation says whose heart is fully committed. Fully committed. If you fully commit your life to Jesus Christ, guess what? He fully commits to you and he shows himself strong on behalf of those who are loyal and committed to him. The roll call is going out. The sound of the roll call is going out today. Owen, are you present? Curtis, are you present? Are you here? Are you ready? Or are you MIA, missing in action? Are you AWOL, absent without leave today? Are you prepared to answer the roll call of heaven that is ringing and surrounding the earth right now? Come and join the army of the Lord. Raise up and be a soldier of Christ that you've been called to be today. And he seeks men and women who hear his voice. He's seeking people who have a heart after God, who will not be satisfied with the status quo. Did you hear that? We get focused on stuff that really doesn't matter. We get focused on stuff that's not going to make a difference to eternal outcomes. We get caught up on little ditty things that really don't mean a difference and never actually going to make a difference in the eternal hall of fame. We get focused on these things that are minutiae things. And God says today, I want you. I want your heart. I'm calling your name today. The roll call of heaven is going out today. He says, I want people who are prepared to live for an eternal purpose. Did you hear that? You know, all around the world, the wealthy are seeking more wealth. Did you know where the greatest gold mine in the earth is today? Let me tell you where the greatest gold mine in the earth is today. It's the local cemetery. Because in the local cemetery, there's books that were never written. There's songs that were never sung. There were dreams that were never completed because somehow we got derailed. Somehow we got sidelined and those dreams are dead and buried in that cemetery. The gold that's in that cemetery is incredible. God wants you to live your dreams today. God wants you to seek out the hand of God today in order to fulfill the purposes of God. He's seeking for people who are prepared to spend their lives on something worthwhile. Something worthwhile. You know, at the end of the day, the Bible says that this earth that we live on is going to be burnt up. It's going to melt with a fervent heat. And Jesus Christ is going to return to this planet. He's going to rule and reign as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And only the things that have eternal value are the things that will remain. Everything else that's temporary will be burned up gone forever, wood, hay, and stubble. When you put a match to it, it's gone. You'll see a bright flame for about three seconds, and then it's going to be just left to ashes. What do you want to build into your life? Gold, silver, and precious jewels, or wood, hay, and stubble? Things that you did that God never asked you to do. Things that you got involved with that had no eternal outcomes. God is, the roll call of heaven is ringing out around the earth today. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, it says here, he he wants to show himself strong to a generation. Do you know what strong looks like when you're talking about the eternal living God? You know what it looks like? That looks like Red Seas being parted. That looks like whole economies, the nation of Egypt being plundered. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they plundered the economy. They took all the gold out of Egypt in one day. In one day. That's what it means to show yourself strong. He was able to cause men to shout a shout after being silent for six days and shout over a fortified city that no man could break into and the walls came crumbling down. This is what it means when God says, I want to show myself strong on behalf of my people. And so he's looking, how is he going to show himself strong on your behalf? Hearts who are loyal to him, hearts who are committed to him. He says, I'm going to breathe my spirit on those hearts. I'm going to pour my spirit out upon those lives today. So will you answer heaven's roll call this morning? Can you hear the call of your name being shouted out through the annals of time? The second thing this morning as we focus on the opening uh, words of Nehemiah, he said, do not be afraid. You see, we've got to understand that fear is a spirit. 
Did you hear that? Fear is a spirit. How many of you have ever experienced fear? That's, uh, that's probably about 100% of us. 99% the others are not quite sure what the question is. <laughs> Paul wrote to Timothy, the young pastor. You know, Timothy had a fear issue in his life. You know what the fear issue was? He was afraid of the older guys that were around about his life. And he would, he would keep res- giving respect and paying homage to the older people. And if he kept on doing that, he'd never fulfill his call. And Paul said, don't despise your youth. Can I say to anyone today that's 35 years old and un- under, don't despise your youthfulness. You know, when I first started be- being a pastor, I was untrained. I was called by God at the age of 20 years old. And by the age of 24 years old, I was pastoring my first church. And you know what? I had so many people. They'd come in and they'd just say, but you're so young to be a pastor. I wish they'd say you're so young to be a pastor now. But time, time has marched on. Time has moved. Uh, and age has taken its brutal course of action in my body. Amen. Even though I grow older every day and the wrinkles keep appearing, I grow younger in my spirit. Amen. That's what God wants us to do, to grow younger on the inside. And so he says, uh, Paul says to Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Do you see that? A spirit, a spirit of fear. Fear is a demon power. And that fear wants to lodge itself like a landmine right up against you and whisper its hideous taunts in your ear to get you to bow down and to step back from moving forward with Jesus Christ. And that fear, that spirit will come to you in many, many different forms. It will stir up your emotions. It will attempt to paralyze your will so that you won't take any course of action. In fact, you'll, take, you'll make no decision. You'll become inactive. And a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all their ways. That's what fear will try and do, paralyze your will to stop you from moving forward in your life. It will attempt to shut down the God-given giftings that are in your life. Did you know that every single one of you are gifted today? You're a gifted child. You know, we, we went through school and we thought, oh, they're the gifted ones, you know, the ones that were in the top class. They're the gifted ones. But did you know the Bible teaches that every one of us are gifted? We have been given special gifts and endowments by the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us. Some of us, yes, are the mouth. Some of us are the mouth. <laughs> some of us are the mouth and some of us aren't so vocal, but we have and express our giftings in different ways that God has given to us. You see, fear will come to you as a giant. When Goliath appeared on the scene, did you know that King Saul was head and shoulders taller than any other man in Israel? He was a big man. They estimate that King Saul was over seven foot tall. He, if, if all the army were lined up shoulder to shoulder, there's Saul. We can see him from a mile away because his head is way above everybody else. Amen? And so Goliath comes out. Israel and the Philistines are faced off against each other, and he walks out into the middle of them. He basically curses God, pulls God's name down, says, I'm going to defy you all and send a man out to fight me. If I beat him, then you're going to be my slaves. But if you beat me, then we'll be your slaves. And the Bible says the whole nation was paralyzed through fear. One giant called Goliath, one man, paralyzed seasoned soldiers who had fought many battles, who were too scared to move out of their ranks and take on Goliath until a 17-year-old kid turned up with bread and cheese to give to his brothers and heard him cursing the God, his God, and was so incensed and so angry, he just said, let me fight him. But you're just a boy. And you see, they had no idea that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual powers of wickedness in heavenly places. David knew it wasn't about size. It was about who was on his side. And he knew God was on his side. And King Saul still hasn't got it. He's still thinking fleshly thoughts about how they're going to defeat this giant of fear called Goliath. And he places his armor. 
How dumb can you be and still breathe? (laughs) Honestly, he's a giant man. He's trying to put his armor on a teenager and expect him to win the battle. His, his emotional IQ was very low that day that, it, that he's sending David out. And I guess he's just saying, oh, this is a death wish. We'll just see how far the boy can fight. David puts it on and he says, he says, I'm not used to fighting with this stuff. I've got my own weapons. I've got my own weapons. I've got weapons that are battle tested. I've got weapons that I've used to kill the bear, to kill the lion. And I'm going to use my weapons to kill this giant. He's going down. There's no fear in David. Perfect love casts out all fear. Hallelujah. And David is standing in the fear of the Lord. He's standing in the confidence of God. And he goes out there and he takes the giant down. And he became top of the charts. All the girls were singing. David slain his thousands, uh, Saul slain his thousands, but David, oh, David, David, he wasn't married. He wasn't married then all, but David, he slain his tens of thousands. And he became a hero in a nation because he stood up against that spirit of fear. I want to tell you today, whatever fear you're facing today, that God is more than able to cause that fear to be completely bound around your life so that you can walk forward into the promises of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Fear is a thief. It robs us. You remember the man who who was given one talent and his master came back to see what he'd done for him. And he said, I feared you, so I hid my money in the ground. I put it in the ground. The guy that received two, he doubled it. He traded with it and he came back and he had double what he'd been given. The man who had five had doubled what he'd been given. And the man who only had one, he said, he says, the scripture says, I was afraid I would lose your money. Do you know fear stops us from so many endeavors in life? Fear stops us from stepping out in faith and business and entrepreneurship and thinking up new inventions. I had a great talk to somebody yesterday and we were talking about the inventions that he'd seen created as a fitter and turner over the years. Guys who were just normally, normal, you know, tradey trained fitters and turners who came up with these incredible inventions that changed the workplace that they were in. What is it that God's calling you to change? What are the ideas he's given you in order to advance the kingdom of heaven for the glory of God? So do not be afraid. Do not fear. Jesus said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He goes on, Nehemiah goes on to say, remember the Lord. Friends, whenever you're getting taunted by fear, I want you to remind yourself about who the Lord is. Remember the Lord. Remember his name. Remember how good he is. Remember what he's done in the history of time. Our our Bible, Old Testament and New Testament are filled with the feats of our God. The incredible, supernatural, super abundant, amazing, incredulistic events of the Bible. Given to a capacious people who are ready to increase their capacity and grow in their faith and to stretch out their hand with the hand of the Lord and see God do incredible things. That God that we're talking about, remember the Lord, he came to this planet. He opened blind eyes. He set demoniacs free. Legion, who responded to Jesus on the shore of Galilee, who came to him. A legion was anywhere between 3,000 and 6,000 men. This man was inhabited by 3,000 demons. He had to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And those demons came flying out of him and into the pigs and they were drowned in the lake. And that man went on to tell his story. He wanted to follow Jesus. You see this? He wanted to, he wanted to, he said, Lord, can I come with you? I want to be close to you. You've changed my life. And Jesus says to him, no, 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 son. The plan is I want you now to go and tell everybody in the 10 cities around about Tecapolis. And I want you to tell everybody the great things that the Lord has done for you. You see, he immediately assigned him purpose and value, and sent him on his way to preach the gospel of Jesus. Oh, but you can't do that. He's only a new Christian. Oh, somebody tell Jesus that? (laughs) You see, Jesus will respond to anyone who has faith in their hearts towards him. And so 
we see that Jesus raised the dead. He delivered people from demons. He forgave his betrayers and he gave his mighty life for us at the cross. And not only that, he rose from the dead. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. One day, the same Jesus that ascended on the Mount of Olives to heaven. The Bible says, in the same way you saw me go, you're going to see me come. I'm going to put my feet back down on the Mount of Olives, one of the most, close to one of the most contested areas of real estate in the world. I've been up on the Mount of Olives and I've looked down across where the Temple of Solomon used to be, across the valley, the Kidron Valley, as you look across to the holy old city of Jerusalem. And I can imagine the King of Glory coming in great power. And the Bible says the earth is going to be split. The angels are going to be crying, holy, holy, holy. Jesus Christ has come back for his bride. There's a call coming out of heaven today for men and women to follow him. There's a call of a cause calling us to make a stand, to live a godly life and to advance the kingdom of God, to challenge the gates of hell today. I'm not talking about doing it in your own strength. I'm talking today about walking and being clothed in the strength of the Lord over your life this morning. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight. He had to get his men to fight. There was so much fear going around about all those that were working on the wall, rebuilding the wall, that he could see it was having a mental effect. Friends, our mental health is so vital to the ongoing battle of Jesus Christ. The enemy will come. And do you know where he attacks us most? The battleground of the mind. And that's why God says to us in the book of Romans, we are to renew our mind. And in the process of renewing your mind, you will transform your life. We can't allow those slithers of demonic activity, the whispers of the devil to get into our ear and begin to affect our mental health today. We've got to take a stand and begin to fight. We're not called to a life of ease. We're not called to live like some other people live. We're not called to a life of comfort. We're called to a cause, the fight of Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual battle, friends. It's not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. Ephesians 6 tells us where the real battle is. It's in the heavenly places where spiritual wickedness dwells, where the enemy is arranging demonic assignments against our lives. That's where the real spiritual battle is. And that's why we need to learn to fight with the right tools. It's a battle against temptation. It's a battle against becoming lukewarm and apathetic. Hello? We've all felt, we've all felt the talents of apathy trying to grab our hearts and pull us back into that sleepy world where we're neither living for God nor living for ourselves, but we're in that middle ground where we're not really living for anything. And apathy is like quicksand. Once you start putting your feet in, you'll find yourself being sucked under. You've got to stand up today and rebuke that spirit of apathy that so often wants to grab our hearts and bring us back down. So God's called us to fight against offenses, fight against distractions and discouragement. And not only that, he's called us to fight daily, daily, daily. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus taught in the greatest prayer that's ever been prayed, the Lord's Prayer. It's a daily battle that God has called us to. And the moment we go on holiday from our devotions, go on holiday from our Bibles, go on holiday from fellowship, That's why Paul, that's why the writer to Hebrews says this, that we should gather together even the more so as we see that day approaching. We need each other. Take an ember out of the fire and place it over here. They're going to keep glowing, but this one's eventually going to go out. You need your brother or your sister who you're sitting beside today. We need each other to continue to fight the good fight Faith. We can't do it solo. We can't do it alone. God's born you into a family. 
And you have brothers and sisters in this family that care for you and want to fight with you against these distractions of the enemy. And we're fighting daily to put on the armor of God, to engage in this battle. And it's a battle with eternal outcomes and eternal consequences. The John Harpers of this world went on the Titanic. Can you imagine being surrounded by the wealth of the world? That some of the wealthiest people in the world were on that boat. Can you imagine all the deals that they're talking about and what they're going to do when they, when they land in New York and what they're going to do when they come back home to England? Can you imagine all the, the, the wheeling and dealing that's going on on that boat, all about stuff and things and, and, and stuff like that? Now, God wants to use that stuff. He wants to use it for his kingdom. But he doesn't want that stuff to get into our heart so it begins to minimize our impact on the world that we live in. And so... We're called to fight the good fight of faith. Can somebody say amen today? I believe this, that God's word can be trusted. I believe this, that God is a good God. I believe this, that there's a good fight of faith that needs to be fought for every single one of our lives. And I believe for you to fulfill your destiny today, there's one key word, and it's the word alignment. Alignment. God, right now there's a call going out around that. Roll call is going out around the world. But you know what the real call is? It's actually a call of aligning your core priorities to the priorities of the kingdom. And where we get drift in our faith is when we begin to drift from the core priorities that Jesus Christ called us to. To love God first with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love people. With everything that God, when we drift from that, friends, we start drifting from the kingdom. And before long, we're sinking in that apathy of quicksand that would engulf us and swallow us up today. So what are you going to do today, friends? What will we do? Will we be spectators? Or will we be participators? So easy to sit on the sideline. Criticize that game of rugby. Oh, they should have done that. They should have done this. They should have done that. If they'd done what I'd said they would do, you know, they would have won. You know, and so often we can sit on the sidelines in Christianity saying, oh, the church should be doing this and the church should be doing that. I want to say, what are you doing? What am I doing for the sake of the kingdom of God this morning? Nehemiah goes on the next verse as we finish this message this morning. Verse 15. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. That God had frustrated them. Do you know that's what God wants to do to your enemies? To frustrate them so that you can accomplish the call of God that is over your life. And when we get that call, suddenly we realize this is where I'm supposed to be on the coal face at the wall, building the wall stone by stone, turning burnt stones, reviving them into the wall of destiny that they can take their place in the army of heaven in the name of Jesus. Verse 16, but from then on, only half of my men Worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. Who's ever wanted to wear a coat of mail? Arr, arr, arr. Coat of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall, and the laborers, laborers carried on their work with one hand, supporting their load, and one hand holding a weapon. And all the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. What a strategy! A trowel in one hand, a sword in the other hand. Nothing is going to stop us from building the work of God and seeing the kingdom of God beginning to expand today. Maybe this morning you've been wearied in the battle. You know there's such a thing as battle fatigue. That's why they don't keep you stationed on the front lines forever. They take you off because they're aware that battle fatigue could cost you your life and the man that's fighting next to you. 
And we've got to understand there's seasons. I'm going to wait for a week's break this week because I'm realizing I'm getting a bit battle fatigued and I need to, you know, refill that well, dig that well and continue to keep seeking the Lord. You know, we've got to keep doing that and being mindful of where we are at in Christ. But maybe you've become battle weary. And today the Holy Spirit wants to refuel you. You know, I was thinking about church this morning. And I just love what was happening in the praise and the worship this morning. You know, people got to understand that church was never supposed to be an event where you just attend to be informed. Are you aware of that? The letter kills. Paul, the great apostle, said the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Jesus said that as well. The spirit brings life. When we come together, it's for impartation. God wants to impart something to you this morning in order for you to continue to serve him with a heart that's full of love for him and love for your fellow man. Because the truth is, through the knocks in life, we get slow leaks. Anyone ever had a slow leak in your car? You know what happens? You know what the deadly thing is about a slow leak? Is that you don't actually see it happening. And then one day you go, get up to go to work and suddenly you see your wheel, your rim is sitting on the ground and your tire is completely empty of air. And that's what slow leaks are like in the Christian life. It's so subtle sometimes you don't see it happening in your heart and then suddenly you get up to go. You get scared to share, to share the gospel with somebody. You get bound by the fear of man. You start skipping coming together to the gatherings of God's people. Because you've got a slow leak that God needs to patch up in your life this morning. So God wants to refill you today. He wants you to be filled with the Spirit of God in the name of Jesus. Do not be afraid, church. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight. Could we stand to our feet today? Only Jesus Christ truly knows this morning the real condition of our hearts. Far be it from me to judge anybody in this building today. Judge not, lest you be judged, the scripture warns us. But the Holy Spirit truly is aware of what's going on inside of you today. He knows our thoughts, our thinking, our coming in and our going out. And this morning, maybe God has challenged you and saying, hey, You've stepped back from the battle. There's some kind of fear that's maybe stopped you from moving forward in your life. And today God wants to set you free from that. So in just a moment, I'm going to open the altar here and I'd love you to come and receive ministry this morning and be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in you and through you today. We're here today to see the Spirit of God do an impartation of his life into us. So please, if you can just delay your exit from the meeting today for that extra bit longer where you're saying, yeah, God, I need a fresh touch from heaven today. God, I need to realign my priorities today. I need to stand and I need to set my mind and set my heart for the priorities of God to be realigned within my heart. If that's you this morning, would you quickly come out of your seat and just come?